Since the start of the Pacific War, we've been following one of the major theatres of the Japanese offensive, the Malayan Campaign. Two weeks ago, the campaign came to its near end with the final retreat of the Allied soldiers towards the British fortress of Singapore. The Malayan Peninsula had been invaded back on December 8th, and the defence of the colony had shown a total lack of readiness on the side of the British government, suffering defeat after defeat and making a critical string of blunders, the Allied forces had rapidly been conceding territory, and only after two months since the invaders first landed at Kota Baru, they had been thrown back to the island settlement, which had been transformed into a fortress. But the British would see that their belief that Singapore was an impregnable fortress was as much a lie as their idea that they could intimidate the Japanese by employing a small naval force in the Pacific. Now the campaign is finally coming to its end, as the Japanese prepare to execute one of their most important operations of the war. For more on the pivotal battles of both world wars, our sponsor Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers, brings you the Battles of the World War series. These documentaries investigate the tactics, technology, legends and hidden truths of climactic 20th century battles to reveal just what happened and why. From Verdun to the Bulge, learn the deep and often enigmatic causes that separated victory and defeat. And while you're there, you'll find the richest and most varied history content available anywhere, covering everything from the ancient to modern eras, wars, biographies, and the Earth itself. And that's just the history stuff. They also give you extensive collections of science, true crime, travel, and other documentaries. You'll never run out of stuff to watch with all this. Plus, they add 15 or more hours of 4K high-definition content every week for their subscribers at no extra cost. It's all viewable anytime, anywhere, on televisions, laptops, mobile devices, and more. Get access to 3,500 hours of ad-free documentaries for only $4.99 a month, and get a month for free by subscribing to Magellan TV via our link in the description. Back on the morning of January 31st, the last of the Allied units, the 2nd Battalion of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, had crossed the Causeway Bridge into Singapore, with its two pipers playing a lament for an empire on which the sun was setting. From this moment onwards, the colony that had been at the great commercial crossroads of the British Empire had but a fortnight to live. General Percival faced two challenges to defend Singapore. First was to contest and defeat any Japanese invasion of the island's north coast, while the second was to protect the vital central portion of the island, where most of the population and key infrastructure of Singapore was located. In an effort to strengthen the western and eastern ends of this vital ground, two defensive lines were envisaged to allow for a quick switch of forces between east and west and to make possible a rapid shortening of the front. These lines had been surveyed and drawn on a map, but were completely unprepared, and the northern shore of the island had a similar story. There were no plans for the defence of this critical front, so Percival quickly developed a plan to defend the coast with posts prepared for prolonged resistance. If the posts were surrounded, they were to hang on and wait for relief by a counter-attacking force, even though the defenders didn't have sufficient men or material to stage any counter-attacks. With this plan in mind, Percival ordered the defence of Singapore in four areas, with the southern area of Major General Keith Simmons, under the protection of the 1st and 2nd Malaya Brigades, the Strait Settlements Volunteer Force, and the Fortress Garrison Troops. The northern area, defended by the British 18th Division under Major General Merton Beckwith Smith, which was at full strength but lacked experience and appropriate training, and the 11th Indian Division, under the overall command of Lieutenant General Lewis Heath, who had previously overseen the two Indian divisions during the Malayan Campaign. The western area, manned by the 8th Australian Division of General Bennett and the semi-trained 44th Indian Brigade, and a reserve area where Brigadier Paris had the undermanned 12th and 15th Indian Brigades. As we can see, Percival chose to appoint more forces to the northern area, 
believing that the main Japanese attack was going to come over here, although the invaders had other plans. Identifying a significant flaw in the Australian sector, where the depleted defenders were hopelessly dispersed, General Yamashita prepared the highly trained and well-led 5th and 18th Divisions to cross the Joho Strait on the western side, where it was at its narrowest and therefore could diminish the chances of suffering heavy casualties. Meanwhile, he also deployed the Imperial Guards Division to the east of the causeway at the Tabrao River, where it was to stage a feint, followed by a secondary attack. This plan was very ingenious, because as the Imperial Guards occupied the island of Pulau Ubin and concentrated artillery fire over the east coast positions, Percival's conviction that the Japanese were going to invade the northern area would be fortified. On February 4th, the Japanese began artillery barrages upon Singapore Island, with their aerial superiority allowing them to have excellent knowledge of the Allies' positions. On the other side, the British had to send small reconnaissance patrols on February 6th to cross the Johor Straits and gather intelligence on the Japanese positions. The patrols successfully reported large concentrations of enemy troops facing the western area, but only saw a few landing craft on the Malayu River. This caused Percival to discard the gathered intelligence as insignificant, with the Malaya command still believing that the main attack of the invaders was coming towards the northern area. Finally, on February 8th, the Japanese launched a heavy barrage of the Australian positions. The invasion of Singapore was just mere hours away. Shortly before night, the Japanese forces started the crossing of the Strait of Johor in 300 vessels, aiming to land between Cape Bulo and Cape Murai and capture the Tenga airfield with haste. On the northwest coast, Brigadier Harold Taylor of the Australian 22nd Brigade had deployed his three battalions across a front approximately 14.6 kilometers wide. He didn't have sufficient men to cover every piece of ground, he had recurring communication problems, and his water obstacles were almost non-existent. As a result, his position was very vulnerable. On the right, the 2nd 20th Battalion was about to face the full strength of the Japanese 5th Division, while to the left, the 18th Division would split to assault the two remaining Australian battalions, three Japanese battalions against the 2nd 18th Battalion and four Japanese battalions against the 2nd 19th Battalion. During the night, the Japanese soldiers continued their crossing of the Straits. Upon detecting their approach, the defenders waited until they were within 40 meters to rain upon them a withering hail of machine gun and artillery fire. The vanguard of the invaders suffered enormous casualties as a result. But the Japanese barges kept coming, and they started to pinpoint gaps in the coastline where they could land virtually unopposed. Soon great concentrations of enemy soldiers began to outflank the scattered Australian machine gunners forcing them to destroy their guns and retreat during the early hours of February 9th. Although some units managed to withdraw in order, most did so in disarray, with many getting completely cut off or fighting a series of hand-to-hand -hand struggles to escape. At the Murai River in particular, the Japanese moved down the river in strength and surrounded the retreating defenders of the 2nd 19th with a series of roadblocks at their rear, while on the northwest coast, the 2nd 20th's men were overwhelmed by the 9 battalions of the 5th Division, losing their commanding officer and suffering several ambushes that inflicted heavy casualties upon the defenders. From both of these battalions, only about a company each would manage to escape towards the Tenga airfield. Meanwhile, the 2nd 18th would successfully reach Amakeng with half of its forces intact, yet despite this, the 22nd Brigade had been effectively rendered combat ineffective. With the invaders securing their position on the northwest coast of Singapore, Bennett sent the reserve 2nd 29th Battalion to Tenga to support the defenders, while Percival also prepared the 12th Indian Brigade to move to Kiat Hong and occupy the Jurong Line for the incoming Japanese attack. In the meantime, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade sought to defend a line running east of Tenga through the village of Bulim, trying to give time for their compatriots to get to Jurong. By nightfall, the Allied forces had completed their assembly at the Jurong Line, 
being further reinforced by the 15th and 44th Indian Brigades. But at the same time, after an increase of Japanese artillery fire, the Imperial Guards Division started to cross the 1.1 km wide Krenji River at the Causeway Sector. This time, the Australian machine gunners not only caused enormous losses on the invaders, but they also managed to hold their ground. Yet despite this, Brigadier Duncan Maxwell of the 27th Brigade decided to withdraw from the critical Causeway Sector by midnight. It appears that he wanted the Malaya Command to surrender to avoid a senseless slaughter. Thus, after destroying their oil tanks, the defenders began to retreat to a perimeter behind the Mandai Road and the Woodlands Road, allowing the Imperial Guards Division to safely land without further interference. At this point, it would seem clear that the Japanese had completely concentrated at the west of the island, but Percival would fail yet again to denude his other areas to adequately reinforce the Jurong Line. By the early morning of February 10th, the Imperial Guards Division were still consolidating their position at Krenji, and they were threatening the 11th Division of General Ki. Immediately, Ki sent the Reserve 8th Indian Brigade to counterattack and recapture a position just south of the former perimeter of the Australians. This attack would fail, causing the death of many Indian defenders, and so Percival assigned the 27th Brigade under Key's command so he could use it to contain the Japanese invaders. Further south, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade finally abandoned Bulim to occupy the central position of the Jurong Line between the 12th and 44th Brigades. In case this line fell to the enemy, Percival had also issued orders to take new positions at an inner point. Brigadier Taylor completely misread these orders upon receiving them, retreating towards Reformatory Road while the Japanese started their attack on the 12th Brigade of Paris. With the threat of getting outflanked by the Japanese to the north and west, Paris then had no choice but to withdraw towards Bukit Pajang. This left a considerable hole in the Jurong Line, and by midday, the invaders began to move down the road to attack the southern end of the line. In response, some Allied units undertook a limited withdrawal, causing a domino effect that ended with both the 15th and 44th Brigades retreating eastwards. By afternoon, the Jurong Line had been completely abandoned to the surprise of the Japanese, who hadn't even engaged the defenders there. At the same time, General Wavell arrived at Singapore, and after being informed of the British blunders, ordered the creation of a fresh reserve composed of three battalions of the yet unused 18th Division to help the Allied units in their defense of the key Bukit Timah area. He also ordered Bennett to launch a counterattack to regain the Jurong Line, using the 12th Brigade to the right, the 15th Brigade in the center, and the 22nd Brigade on the left flank. By midnight, this operation would prove a disaster. On the right, Paris lost half his forces due to desertions and the efficacy of tenacious Japanese soldiers, while the 2nd 29th Battalion was pummeled by a strong tank attack that forced them to retreat to Tenga. Hot on their heels, the Japanese tanks would follow on and capture the road junction at Tima, severing the 12th from the rest of the Allied forces and forcing Paris to retreat towards Tanglin. Meanwhile, the 15th and 22nd Brigade had made some progress, but they were to be cut off by the 5th Division, which was very close to taking Tenga. The defenders would then be subsequently decimated by the 18th Division in the early hours of February 11th, with few survivors escaping towards Pasir Panjang and Reformatory Road. With his battlefront completely lost, Bennett desperately ordered the reserve Tom Force to recapture Bukit Timah and then Bukit Panjang against the full might of the 5th and 18th Divisions, who had now consolidated their positions. Under black clouds of burning oil, the British soldiers were, as expected, rapidly repelled by the elite Japanese divisions, suffering heavy casualties and being forced to retreat. Bennett now only counted with the Tom Force at the racecourse, and with the 44th Brigade around Pasir Panjang, joined by the 1st Malaya Brigade, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade, and the 2nd Battalion of the Gordon Highlanders. While east of the racecourse, Percival ordered General Heath to organize the defense of Singapore town, 
who then established the Massey force in a line that extended to Thompson village. But to the north, Brigadier Maxwell yet again committed a terrible decision when he ordered his 27th Brigade to launch a counterattack towards Bukit Panjang. By the morning of February 12th, the brigade had been surrounded and had to retreat, yet again leaving Heath's left flank in great peril. The general then acted accordingly and evacuated the northern area to better positions further south. Yet the Imperial Guards division rapidly attacked the 8th Brigade near Nesum and achieved a devastating victory. At the same time, the 5th Division started its assault over the racecourse, overcoming the defences of both the Tom Force and Massey Force and forcing them to retreat. With the threat of a Japanese breakthrough towards Singapore town, Percival finally ordered Bennett to establish new defensive positions at a line that stretched from Buona Vista to Tanglin Holt and from there to the Bucket to Marfara Road Junction, while Heath established his 18th Division on a line that went from this junction through Thompson Village towards the Woodley Crossroads, and his 11th Division from Woodley to the Payalabar Airstrip. Lastly, the 2nd Malaya Brigade took positions between this airstrip and the Kalang Airfield. This was to be the final defence of Singapore. As dawn broke on the morning of February 13th, the Allied soldiers' morale was unravelling, with no hope of avoiding Singapore's final demise. The new defensive perimeter lacked depth, both in numbers and equipment. The Allied units had suffered many desertions, many soldiers had given up the fight, supplies were very low, and the city of Singapore had been constantly and mercilessly bombed from the air and shelled from the ground. In response, Percival called a general meeting with his commanders at Fort Canning, where both Heath and Bennett strongly advocated for an immediate capitulation something that Percival himself vehemently opposed. An evacuation using all of the remaining ships at Singapore Harbour was nonetheless ordered, resulting in the final evacuation of 1,800 military personnel and 1,200 civilians for Java and Sumatra. The rest would have to stay and face death or imprisonment. The day also saw Bennett concentrating most of his remaining formations in an 11-kilometre concentric perimeter around Holland Road and the Tanglin Barracks. There they would continue to resist the Japanese incursions, although the invaders would largely leave them alone, and to the north, the British defenders would be repulsed from Thompson Village, having to establish new defensive positions to the north of Bradle Road. Meanwhile, the Japanese, ever closer to their final objective, concentrated their attack on the front held by the 1st Malaya Brigade around Pasir Panjang, penetrating their defensive line and forcing them to retreat to Buena Vista. The following day, Yamashita finally managed to concentrate his entire army on Singapore Island, applying pressure all along the battlefront, but deciding to concentrate his assault along the southwest coast. Around Raja Road, the 1st Malaya Battalion was attacked yet again, suffering heavy casualties as the invaders broke through towards Bukit Chermin and captured the water supplies of Singapore. During this attack, elements of the 18th Division got to the Alexandra Hospital, where the Japanese committed another act of indiscriminate slaughter against defenseless non-combatants. In the north, Japanese tanks also broke through and reached the outer limits of Mount Pleasant, leaving the British defenders in a U-shaped loop, while to the east, the Indian defenders successfully managed to resist the assaults of the Imperial Guards Division. In the end, though, Percival realised that the water supply of Singapore town was imminently going to collapse, so he knew that the only options were to counterattack to restore the town's water supply and food dumps, or to capitulate and avoid a senseless slaughter of his civilian population. On February 15th, he finally bowed to the inevitable and decided on the latter. Yamashita later wrote, My attack on Singapore was a bluff, a bluff that worked. I had 30,000 men and was outnumbered more than 3 to 1. I knew that if I had to fight for long for Singapore, I would be beaten. That is why the surrender had to be at once. I was very frightened all the time that the British would discover our numerical weakness and lack of supplies and force me into disastrous street fighting. 
In total, the British had suffered 138,708 casualties in the Malayan campaign, with more than 130,000 becoming prisoners of war in the Pudu and Changi prisons, as well as the other prison camps across the Thai Burma Railway. In comparison, Japanese casualties totaled only 9,824 for the entire campaign. With the fall of Singapore, the Malay barrier had been breached, and Burma and the Dutch East Indies now laid ripe for the taking. The Japanese would now launch their invasions of Sumatra and Lower Burma. So don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of the Pacific War. You should subscribe and press the bell button if you want to be notified about our videos. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.